preface this message this morning, I just want to say that uh, this is God's Word. These are going to be strong words this morning, but God's Word is strong. And as a believer of Christ, the church body, we need to stand firmly on God's Word. Amen? Amen. And we need to take care of our children as well as our unborn children. So if you will, turn with me to Psalm chapter 139. We're going to be looking at, to begin, we're going to be looking at verses 13 through 16 this morning. As you're turning there, on January 22nd, 1973, the day that America entered into the deadliest war on human life known to mankind, is the day that our country declared abortion, the termination of an unborn child, to be a legal procedure. Eleven years later after that, President Ronald Reagan designated January 22nd as National Sanctity of Human Life Day. It is a day to remember and to be advocates of life. And although this day is focused not only on abortion, but also on racism and suicide, today we will focus on abortion, for abortion is a silent killer. America has one of the greatest genocides the world has ever seen happening in her very own backyard. It's estimated that 19% of pregnancies end with an abortion. Three leading reasons for this. One, they finished having children. Two, they can't afford a baby. Or three, they're not ready for a child. And it's estimated that every 26 seconds, a child loses their life to an abortion. Every 26 seconds. That means by the time I finish this sermon, over 60 children will have been terminated. Estimated that nearly 1 million abortions occurred just in 2016 alone. From the Revolutionary War to the War on Terror in 2012 and all the wars in between, 1.2 million lives were lost. But from 1973 just to 2011, over 53 million lives were lost to abortion. So today I simply want to highlight why abortion is wrong and it's unbiblical and why it's murder, and place the facts of how we must stop this atrocity from progressing any further. I'm going to share facts from the Word of God, but also a little bit from science. I like to call science how the Lord has let us uh, see, see how His creation's made, kind of behind the closed doors. Let us a little peek into how it's done. For we know God is the creator of all science. Amen? Friends, an unborn child is a human being created by God in the image of God with a plan by God. So if you will, read with me Psalm 139, beginning with verse 13. It says, For you formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen an unformed substance, and in your book were written all the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not yet one of them. So the first thing I want to highlight this morning, church, is simply this, that life begins when God creates. There's much debate right now about when life begins. Is it from after they're born or when they get a heartbeat or when there's brain activity? Well, the Bible tells us that life begins when God creates. When God creates. Now, I know for most of us, it's probably been a little while since we've been in a science classroom. And so I'm going to kind of give us a brief update uh, just from the scientific side, just about what happens when God creates a child. So at the moment of conception, when God creates a new and unique human being, they come into existence with their own distinct genetic code. 23 chromosomes from each parent creates a brand new <clears throat> and totally unique genetic combination. There is enough information, that tiny little zygote, to control human growth and development, the duration of the child's entire life. 21 days after conception, so just three weeks after conception, after God creates, eight days after first taking shape, the heart starts beating. Isn't that amazing? 
not even detectable at that point, but the heart starts beating 21 days in. Now, as you think about this, in our world today, when we have you know, heart surgeries and things like that, the doctors begin the heart by shocking it, to get it to come back to life. They, they regulate the rhythm of it by shocking it. My question is this, after that final cell, the heart is created in the womb. Who starts the heart? Who shocks that little heart to start beating? It's not by accident. It's not by a big bang church. It's by the hand of God. God is creator. And 21 days in, when that final cell is formed, God kicks it back to life. God starts that little heart. The next four days, the heart gets its rhythm, its regular rhythm. And before the child is even born, this little heart will beat approximately 54 million times. 54 million times. At this point, kidneys are being formed. The little eye boulders are visible. The brain begins diving or dividing into three primary sections. The, the forebrain, the midbrain, the high brain. Arms and legs also start taking shape. Day 26, arm buds are visible. Day 28, upper and lower arms can be distinguished. The embryo is now surrounded and protected by the amniotic sac and is actually starting to produce the necessary cells for that child itself to be able to reproduce. Let's go ahead and put week five up there. So this is an ultrasound picture. Five weeks and six days. Five weeks and six days. For most of us, it, you know, it doesn't really look like much at this point, but that is a child. And as I said, at this point, all those things are present. At this point, brain waves are detectable. Brain waves are detectable at this point. It means there's a heartbeat. It has been for several weeks. Brain waves are detectable. And the embryo responds reflexively to stimulus. What does that mean? It means that doctors who perform abortions, some have stated that they've seen the baby move and flinch. Why is that? Because if there's brain waves, that means there's nerves connected. And that means this baby feels pain. It hurts. But yet our world today still sees this as not living, not a child. Week eight, every organ is present and is in its place. At week eight, 90% of the structures found in an adult human being can be found in this tiny fetus. Let's go to week 10. Now it looks like a baby, right? 93% of abortions occur at or before 13 weeks. So that includes this in three weeks past. Think about that. A living child with a beating heart, brain waves. It's a living child made by God. Let's go to 20 weeks. Continues to grow. Arms and legs begin to form. Eyes begin to form. The nose is beginning to be formed. Let's go on to 30 weeks. And here's the profile. You really can start seeing the shape and the features of the baby. And what I love about getting to 30 weeks is that you're able to get what's called a 4D ultrasound, which really allows you to see what the child really looks like. Not any of this 2D black and white stuff. It really brings the child to life and really what they look like. It's kind of a sneak peek in just to kind of take a glimpse of them. And so let's, let's show the next pic here. So this is a 4D ultrasound at 32 weeks. You notice the picture here, the, the shape of the lips and the nose. If you know my daughter, Kaya, this is her. Okay? This is Kaya. And so after this, if you want to go by the nursery, after we get her out, and you look at her lips, that's her. You can see the exact, the exact forming of it. Isn't it beautiful and sweet that God has given mankind the technology to see this? You know, many people say, well... Still not living, doesn't have a personality. Yes, it does. I can prove it. God blessed my family with us being in the room at the perfect time 
with the doctor putting the ultrasound thing right where it's supposed to be at the perfect time to get this next shot. Look at that smile. All right? What a beautiful smile. No one can tell me that my daughter didn't have a personality at 32 weeks. Amen? And also, I'll say this, just to, just to kind of, this is fun, that while we were pregnant with, with Kaya, every time I would get up to preach on Sundays, Kaya would start kicking and, and going crazy in her mama's belly. Because she heard, I would say, well, she knows the word of God. She loves it. She wants to hear more. So 32 weeks. So friends, these are the scientific facts about life and when life begins. And this is what's being argued over. Is this truly a child? Is this truly a child that's alive or not? This is why I say life begins when God creates. So now we're done with science. Back to the Bible. Biblical position. David wrote here the Psalm of 139, 13 through 16. And let me mention a couple of parts that he mentioned. He said, you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together. Now, I remember when I was younger, I remember looking at my arms and these little seams, you know, by your wrist and, and in your arm where your elbow attaches right here, those little seams that you have. I once asked my mom, I said, mom, what are these? And I remember she replied, well, son, that's where God sewed you up. And I'm looking at Scripture now, I'm thinking, she wasn't wrong. God knew what he was doing. He knitted us together. And David goes on to say that we're fearfully and wonderfully made in the, in, in the image of God. He saw us when we were being made. He was there intricately weaving us together. It says, your eye saw my unformed substance. So friends, God is there every step of the way. We can't say, oh, it's just mom and dad and genetics doing their thing. No, that's just allowing us to see a little peek into how God is forming and how God is creating. But it's God that's in charge of those cells. It's God that's in charge of the chromosomes. It, God is in charge of biology. God is in control of all this. Life begins when God creates. If you will turn me to Judges chapter 13. This is when the angel appears to Samson's mom before Samson is, is conceived and born. And I want us to see the instructions given to her here by this angel. It says, Then the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold now, you are barren and have borne no children, but you shall conceive and give birth to a son. Now therefore, be careful not to drink wine or strong drink, or eat any unclean thing. For behold, you shall conceive and give birth to a son, and no razor shall come upon his head, for the body shall be a, for the boy shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb. Friends, most of us know the story of Samson. He took the Nazarite vow. No razor would touch his head. He wouldn't take in anything unclean. He wouldn't drink any alcohol. But it goes beyond that. The angel appeared to his mom saying, hey, this boy won't even take it before he's born because he's already set apart by God. God sees him as a human being already before he's born. He was supposed to stay clean before his birth. And that means, church, that life begins when God creates. When God sets you apart, he sets you apart before you're even created. Life begins when God creates. Secondly, life belongs to God. Genesis 1, 26-27 says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image. Let us, the Trinity, saying, Let's make man in our image according to our likeness. And let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Friends, nobody owns their own life. God creates every life that's ever been conceived. And it's by his image. 
there's a reason why he emphasizes this like three or four times in this passage. Let us create man in our image. In our image, we will create them. Let me also mention that it says create them male and female. God makes no mistakes, church. God makes no mistakes. He knows exactly who's he creating when he's creating them. We're created in God's image. And thus we bear that image. You know, I know we've all said, oh, whenever we have a newborn baby, oh, they look so much like their mom or they look so much like their dad. Why? Because we bear the image. And many people say, oh, that's just, that's genetics. That's how it works. Well, that's how God works, isn't it? We bear the image. We bear the image of, of our creator. Every child conceived is created in the image of God. That means God is their father. That means God is their creator. That means God basically is the one that's given them life, which means life belongs to God. Several years ago, whenever we were, were pregnant with Zane, we also went and had a 4D ultrasound of him, and we invited the whole family in. Everyone came in that big viewing room, and we were so excited to see him and, and everything like that. And so the image popped up, and we were on and ooing, and we were crying, and we were laughing, and we were giggling. And, and then my sister just says, as loud as she can, that looks like Dad. I'm like, say what? Looks like Dad. I'm looking, and I'm like, okay. But I'll have you know, he does look just like my dad. He acts like my dad. I always tell people, I'm raising my dad. <laughs> it's really shocking. <laughs> and he was silly and goofy and all that. I'm like, well, that's not my dad. But then I saw a video of my dad when he was that age, and he was the goofiest little kid I've ever seen. I'm like, oh, my goodness, I'm raising my dad. But see, we, we bear the image of God. And God loves each and every child. We, we, I, thank you, Steve, for singing these songs today. Just a simple reminder that God loves all the little children. God loves all the children, even unborn children. God loves them. Let me highlight one more thing in this passage. After he says, let's create man in our image. He says, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, cattle over all the earth, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Do you see something that's missing in there? It doesn't say let man rule over the unborn children. It doesn't say let man rule over man and have the authority to take life away. He's given us the authority to eat animals, to eat vegetation, to tend to his creation. But nowhere does it say that we have the authority to take the lives of unborn children. That is God's. God is the creator of life. Life belongs to God. And lastly here, life must be defended. Friends, we know life begins when God creates. Life belongs to God, but life also must be defended. Proverbs 24, 11 and 12, it states this, deliver those who are being taken away to death and those who are staggering to slaughter. Oh, hold them back. If you say, see, we do not know this, does he not consider it who weighs the heart? And does he not know it who keeps your soul? And will he not render to man according to his work? So consider this verse in context of what we're discussing today. Deliver those who are being taken away to death. Friends, over 55 million helpless children have been led away to death and slaughter through abortion. So what are we supposed to do about it? We can't just say, well, I, we, we didn't know about it. It is a silent killer, but we're very much aware of the implications of abortion in our country, are we? Verse 12 says that no one will be able to claim ignorance no one. We will be held accountable. So how do we change this? 
How do we change this genocide from occurring any longer? First of all, let me just say this. If you're in here, or if you're listening online, and you have been affected by abortion, if you've been a part of abortion, there can be salvation and forgiveness in Jesus Christ. Grace and peace can be found in Christ Jesus. He wants you to come to Him. You should not have to carry that guilt with you any longer. Place it at the throne of Christ and let Him bring you the peace that surpasses all understanding. Listen, we as a church body need to uplift and encourage those that have had abortions. We need to love on them and extend the love of Christ to each and every one. Friends, we're all sinful. We're all sinners. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. So there's no need for us to be judging, but rather loving and uplifting and encouraging them. Friends, if you're in here and have been affected by that, I want you to hear this, that God loves you. And He wants to give you the grace and the mercy that only He can provide to you. Salvation is found only in Christ. So don't be sitting in here thinking, well, you'll never be accepted because you've done this. No. God loves you and wants to bring you forgiveness. All you have to do is bring it forward to Him. So why don't you do that today? Don't carry that burden any longer. Secondly, how do we change things? We need to support and be advocates for organizations that help prevent abortion. We have several here in, in Fort Smith. We're actually helping one right now with a, I guess it's a baby shower of kind, uh, with a uh, pack and play in a crib out here in the foyers and the lobbies. It's for heart to heart. You know, they provide counseling and, and ultrasounds and support before the child's born and even after the child is born. You realize 90% of women that that choose not to abort, or 90% of women that, that see their baby through an ultrasound choose not to abort. 90%. As we've seen these pictures, we can see why. We can see why. That's why we need to fight and we need to stand up for these agencies that are supporting life. We also need to be advocates for the unborn and encourage those who have unwanted pregnancies and those seeking abortions to reconsider and to choose life. Friends, we also need to also consider adoption. Adoption is very important. 74% of women said that their reasoning for having an abortion was that they didn't have the means to provide for the baby. That's easy to, to fix. There are many couples today that are seeking to have a child, but for one reason or another, the Lord has not blessed them in that way. I honestly believe it's so that they can adopt. There's many children that need to be adopted. And who's going to adopt? Family? Church? We need to stand up and be at the lines and, and to support that. Okay? You may not be in a position to adopt today. I understand that. But we need to be in a position always to support that and to be advocates for it. We need families lining up to adopt children. And we need to provide for these children and, and rescue them from death. And listen to this. We have all been adopted. Do you know that? If you're in Christ Jesus, you have been adopted into the family of God. In Romans 8, 14 and 15, it says, For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again. Listen to this. But you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. By which we cry out, Abba in, in Greek means Daddy. We cry out, Daddy. I am so thankful I have been adopted in the family of God. I'm so thankful I am able to call Jesus my Father. I'm so thankful to be an inheritance of the kingdom of God and to heaven one day. 
We've all been adopted through that blood of Christ, adopted out of darkness, rescued from death, and given a new life. And should we not extend that to every unborn child to have that opportunity? And also, church family, I'm not getting political here. Just saying this. You all have a God-given right in America to vote. So do it. Vote, pray, vote however the Lord leads you to vote. Be an active citizen. Because the Lord's going to place an office in our political leaders. He's going to place those people in place. But He's going to use you to place them there. So won't you be an advocate for that and do your part for the kingdom of God and be active in participating in the rights in which you've been given. And then also pray. Pray, 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 pray. Actively be in prayer for and engage with our governing leaders. 1 Timothy 2, 1 and 2, it states this, for First of all, then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men, for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. We're called by God to pray for our leaders. No matter who they are, no matter which side of the hall they're on, which side of the line they're on, we're called to pray. Pray that God's will will be done in their lives. And lastly, church, pray for the church. Let's pray for one another. You know, as much as I like to say, yeah, we, we've all got it figured out. We don't, right? We don't have it figured all figured out. I remember going to OBU and for my undergraduate and sitting there thinking, man, I, I've been raised in church. I've been to Sunday school. I know all this stuff. And getting there and going to my Old Testament class and getting a pop quiz the first day and walking out feeling like a complete failure because I had flunked my first quiz over list the Ten Commandments in order. Are you kidding me? I've been in church for 20 years and I'm called to preach and I can't even do... Yeah. It's amazing what the Lord teaches us when we study the Word of God. Let's never think that we have it all figured out, okay? Because I have met some well-intended Christians, godly Christians, that have said abortion is wrong. Unless, and they start putting qualifiers on it. Okay? I don't know what your stance is on it, but I'm just here to share the Word of God with you and pray that the Lord will speak to you, Okay? Because some people say, well, it's, it's, it's wrong unless there was a rape or there's something wrong with the child. Friends, first and foremost, whether a child was conceived in love or in sin has no bearing on God's love for his very own creation. God has a plan for a child no matter what their circumstances are. Secondly, with rape victims, it accounts for less than half of 1% of all abortions. Half of 1%. So it's very, very low percentage. Listen, Christians, I challenge you today to uphold the right of every God-ordained life that has been created by the Father of lights. Defend those who cannot defend themselves. And know this, that God makes no mistakes. You know, whenever we were pregnant, we were offered a test to see if this child would have this problem or that problem or if things lined up right, and we declined it. Just our own personal convictions here, because we knew no matter what that test came out to be, we were having that child. And so it didn't matter. Friends, defend those who cannot defend themselves. Because I know once we leave this place, heaven forbid, if we got a taller or a young child that runs out in the street onto the Highway 71 here, that everyone in this room, every adult in this room would do everything we possibly could to protect that child, wouldn't we? We'd be screaming for help, trying to get attention, or running out there and snatching them, stopping trying, whatever it would be, we would all jump to action to protect them. And today I'm calling us to jump into action to protect 
all the unborn children that we can. Do not turn your back on those who need comfort and guidance. Stand tall and be the hands and feet of Jesus. And church, I know it's, abortion is one of these things that it's, it's a silent killer. You're not around it all the time. It's, it's kind of silent. It's kind of out of sight. If you're like me already, it's kind of out of sight, out of mind, right? Let's make it a point of prayer. You know, last year, there was a great stride in, in, in overturning Roe versus Wade. But I didn't hear much activity from the church in that. Not much excitement. Why? Where is our faith? We didn't get excited because we thought, oh, well, it'll get overturned back the other direction probably soon. That's not faith. We've been praying for this for years. Let's continue to pray, church. No matter what happens, continue to pray. The battle's not over. And the most powerful tool we have as believers is prayer. We believe that God created all. We believe that every unborn child is created in God's image. We believe that life begins when God creates. We believe that life belongs to God. And we believe that life must be defended. So when we pray, let's believe that and know that God is ultimately going to protect His own children and His own creation. The church this morning. Remember, life begins when God creates. Life belongs to God. And life must be defended. Let's continue to pray for those who have been affected by this or are going to be affected by it soon. Let's, let's continue to pray for them and lift them up. Let's encourage them. Let's pray for our lawmakers and our government officials. Pray for our country and pray for our churches that we will stand strong. Because life, children, are a blessing from God. They're to be celebrated. They're to be excited. I don't know about you, but looking at these ultrasound pictures, I got excited again. Whether they're children or mine or not, it's, it's exciting to see life coming into the world. And how precious are they. So thankful that all the kids got up here this morning. It was so sweet. So friends, today, won't you stand up for them? And as we are finishing up here, let me ask you this. Have you been born again? Has the Lord touched your heart? And has He led you to salvation in Him? So as I mentioned earlier, salvation can only be found in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If you would bow your heads with me this morning. Father God, we thank You for today. I thank You for Your Word and Your message and Your truth. Lord, what a great battle we have before us in protecting unborn children. Lord, unborn children that are created in Your image, that are beautiful in Your sight, that You have just woven together so well. Lord, may we as believers stand up strong for You. May we be advocates May we not ignore the issue thinking it's too big and that nothing will happen, but may we believe in the power of prayer and go to bat. May we encourage others. May we uplift others that are being affected by it. Father, I pray that today if there's one in here, Lord, that they themselves do not know You. May today be the day of salvation, Lord. May they turn their life over to You. Father, we, we've all made mistakes. We've all have sin in our lives, Lord. You say we all have sin and fall short of the glory of God. So Lord, may today be the day of salvation for some that are in here today. Lord, may you just work in their heart. Lord, if there's one in here that needs to rededicate their life, turn their life over to you, Lord. Get right or just maybe they're carrying guilt from the past that just needs to lay it down at your altar. Father, may they come forward today to do that very thing. Lord, you are such a good, good Father, a loving God, a God of forgiveness, a God of grace and mercy, a God of salvation, and we praise you for that. Lord, take this time of invitation and use it, Lord, to further your kingdom. Father, we just thank you for it, and we praise your name. And all God's people said, amen. If you will, church family, stand with me this morning. I want you to listen to the Lord this morning.